You know, some of the most stirring verses in the Bible are found in Philippians 3. The passage that begins with verse 8 says, I also count all things loss, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. And listen to our goal that's listed in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. That's the amazing word of God that we're going to study today on Through the Bible. I'm Steve Sweats, and our Bible teacher is Dr. J. Vernon McGee, and we're well on our way in our five-year journey through the peaks and valleys of Scripture. Our destination was described just now from Philippians. Our goal is to know Christ and the power of His resurrection, and to be conformed to His image, as another passage in Romans 8 says. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible, by the way. This is the mystery of godliness that Dr. McGee will talk about in our study of 1 Timothy now. So if you've been on the Bible bus for more than one trip, you know how the power and the beauty of God's Word comes alive, especially as you understand each of the books and how they fit together with all the other books of the Bible. So grab your Bible and open it to 1 Timothy, and we're going to start in chapter 4. And if you haven't gotten your free copy of Briefing the Bible, our book that's got all of Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for all of our studies, including 1 Timothy, then you need to visit the resources section over at ttb.org and download it for yourself. Or if you'd prefer to receive an abridged paperback copy by mail, you can call us 1-800-65-BIBLES, the number. You can also email us at biblebus at ttb.org. Let's pray together as we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you that your goal for us is to be more like your Son. Thank you for your word that takes us step by step through this life, always pointing us to Jesus. And it's in his name we ask for your insight today. Amen. Let's dive into 1 Timothy 4 as we make our way through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we're in this section here that we've come to in 1 Timothy, where we're actually dealing with the officers in the church. He brought to our attention in a very definite way the fact that there was coming into the church an apostasy, That is, there would be men who would profess to believe, but they would move away from the faith and finally get to the place where they would deny it, and they would put an altogether different emphasis upon the Word of God. And as a result, why a good minister should warn people of that. And Paul says in verse 6, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine under which thou hast attained. Now, actually, the minister and every believer is a minister, but here he's thinking of Timothy as being a teacher of the Word of God, and I believe that this is a gift some men have, some don't, Some men have another gift. They have the gift of a pastor, that is, to be able to deal with people personally and individually. But all believers are ministers. We've seen that before. And therefore, a believer, how will he be able to build up himself? I get letters from so many pastors. They feel a great need, many of us in the ministry, How are we going to grow in the Word of God? And he's going to talk about that just a little later. But here he's making it clear that the way we're to be built up is not to go off in a tangent on this matter of diet or this matter of you can eat this and you shouldn't eat that and that we have to adopt some ascetic program as if that would commend you to God. Well, what are we to be built up in? Well, our diet is to be nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. And he commends Timothy here that he's attained to that. Now, some folk think that there was a danger of Timothy over there in the city of Ephesus where there was so much of religion and the work of Satan was so obvious over there that there was a danger of this young preacher going off in that. I don't think so. I think Paul makes it clear, you've attained to this, Paul says. Now, that's the thing that you are to pass on 
to these others that they might warn against that thing. And now he moves on down in this that he should warn them not only of the apostasy and false teachers by teaching the words of faith himself, but now he is to refuse or to avoid profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather under godliness. That is in verse 7. He is to practice godliness in his life, but he is to refuse the profane and old wives' fables. I know when I grew up as a boy, there were a lot of old sayings that would be quoted to us as children by the older people. I know that we visited in a home, and I think she was a dear Christian woman, but she had some of the most peculiar things. And I remember that she had something that everybody should have, and that was sulfur and tartar. And I was fed that because my mother listened to her. And I want to tell you, I've had enough sulfur and tartar to make a small mountain. And I don't know whether it did me any good or not, but she thought it was the thing to do, that that's all that I needed as a boy, if you just give him plenty of sulfur and tartar. And by the way, it was mixed in honey sometimes and mixed in molasses at other times. And I want to say I didn't care too much for it. And I don't know that it did me any good at all. These are the things that he's warning against. And when I had cancer, I suppose that I received, without exaggeration, over a hundred books on diet of what I was to eat to get rid of cancer. And the very interesting thing is that I never followed any of them because if any one you'd follow, you'd contradict the other. One book said, eat plenty of grapes. Another one said, don't touch them. One book said, eat honey. Other said, don't touch it. Another said, let white bread alone, and that sort of thing. Well, I never paid too much attention to that because I was listening more to the great physician. He had my case, and I felt like that he could handle it. And this type of thing today, so many people put more emphasis on that than they do the Word of God. Now, no minister ought to be emphasizing that type of thing. After all, we are to give out the Word of God. Now he makes this statement here that's quite interesting. He says, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now there are those that believe that Paul here is downgrading bodily exercise. I don't understand it that way. After all, I want you to look at that man for just a moment. I think that Paul attended the games that they had in those great coliseums in that day. Now, Paul spent several years in Ephesus, about three years. When he was there, there was a great coliseum in which they actually had the Olympic Games at times. And they had the races there, that is, men running. And it would seat 100,000 people. And Paul uses the figure of the race of that day and makes a correspondence to the Christian life and the Christian walk and that the Christian life is actually a race in and of itself. May I say to you, this man knew a great deal about it. I believe he exercised. And then somebody said, can you be sure of that? Yes, and I'll tell you when this was made very emphatic to me. When I stood yonder in the city of Sardis, that is the ruins, and I looked down, they've excavated part of the Roman road there, and I looked down that Roman road to the east, and Paul came down that road. Then I looked down that road going to the west. And I thought the man that came along here 1,900 years preaching the gospel of Christ, he didn't travel in a bus or in an automobile. He didn't travel either by horse or even by donkey. Paul walked that. And it took a rugged individual to cover the ground that this man covered 
throughout the Roman Empire. And when he was not going by ship, he spent most of that period walking. That was his method. And I don't think he did much jogging, but I think Paul did a great deal of walking, and that is something that, you know, is recommended today. Now, all Paul is saying here is, and these people were given over to games, to athletics, and we become that kind of a nation. Every city today has built a great coliseum where great spectacles are conducted, and great many Christians put more emphasis upon this than they do upon the things of God. I know that there are today church officers that will spend more time in the summertime in the ballpark than they spend in the prayer meeting. And all Paul is saying, he's not saying that's wrong. What he's saying is this, let's hold things in the correct perspective. Bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable for all things. Now, what is the difference between the two as far as importance is concerned? Well, bodily exercise will only help you in this life because when you get a new body, it won't make any difference whether you exercise in this body or not. But godliness, and this, my friend, is indicative of something. If you listen to Paul here, godliness is profitable to all things. Now, there are those that are saying today, well, a Christian can come back to God on easy terms, and he can. I emphasize that. And a Christian can get in sin, fine, that's true, he can, and he can come back to God. But my friend, a godly life pays off not only down here, but it'll pay off in eternity, whereas the prodigal son lost a great deal by going to the far country. And any Christian that's living a careless life and not living a godly life will find out that even in eternity, he'll have to pay for that sort of thing. Paul is saying, if you give yourself to bodily exercise, then fine. I think Paul did it, but he said, wait a minute. What about godliness? Are you as anxious about godliness as you are about physical exercise, about athletic events? And remember that the physical exercise ends at the end of this life, but godliness is carried over to the next. Now, this is very important, I think, for us to see. And he says this, he puts an emphasis on it in verse 9, now chapter 4 of 1 Timothy. This is a faithful saying, and it's worthy of all acceptance. In other words, he says, here's something you can count on. You can count on it in Ephesus in the first century, and you can count on it in Los Angeles in the 20th century, and you'll be able to count on it in the 21st century when we get there. Verse 10, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Now, again, we have something very important here. First thing is, if you stand for Jesus Christ today, it'll cost you something. There's no question about that. Then the next thing here that's very important is to know that the Lord Jesus, he's the Savior of all men. Today, we've had a great deal of discussion about the fact, what was the color of Christ's eyes? How did Jesus look when he was here? Was he a blonde or a brunette? And a man said to me several years ago, he says, you know, I saw a terrible picture. He says, they painted a black Christ. Well, I said to him, why not? I said, he's the savior of all men. Now, friends, the important thing to understand is not the color of his skin, is not the color of his hair. It's not how high he was, how tall he was, or how much he weighed. That's not the important thing. And the scripture never lets you in. Although he became a man, they never tell you anything about his description. The FBI just doesn't have it in their files today of how he looked, how high he was, and all that kind of information. But may I say to you, the Bible has it in its files. He's the savior of all men. 
And whoever you are, he's your Savior. And he's the only Savior. But who does he save? Those that believe. You can turn him down if you want to. There is a plane. We're told it leaves the international airport here every minute. May I say to you, I can get on any of them, but I don't. But every now and then I screw up my courage. Like when I went to Florida, I screwed up my courage. I got a ticket and I got on the plane going to Miami, Florida. It's a plane for everybody, but not everybody's going. Christ is the Savior of all men, but it's those that believe. I had to believe enough to get on the plane. This is important for us to see. Now, will you notice, these things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth. There would be those in the church that say, well, he's just a young fella. He doesn't know yet, and maybe he didn't, but don't let anybody despise your youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Now, how can you keep them from it? Don't act like a young fool. <laughs> May I put it very plainly? That is a thing that an old retired minister said to me when I began as a young preacher before I was ordained. I told him, I said, I feel a little embarrassed. I'm just a student out there. And when I see a person with gray hair come in, I get frightened. He said, don't ever worry about that. Don't let anyone, he says, and he gave me this scripture, despise your youth. But you make dead sure you're an example of the believers. That's the important thing. It's not age that's important, but whether you're an example of the believers, in what way? In word and in conduct and in love and in spirit and in faith and in purity. Now today we may have a new morality. The Bible has a new morality also, and this is it. And believe me, in this day and age in which we live, this is brand new to a lot of folk. And I'd like to say this today because I know that there are a lot of young believers that are listening to me. Here is God's standard. We should be an example today in word, in our conversation, in our conduct, in our love, in our spirit, and in faith, and in purity. Now he says, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. Now, may I say this, that we've come to here is something else. First of all, he said to him, and apparently Timothy was a young man. I think he must have been in his 30s. And now he says here, the minister is to read the scriptures publicly. For what purpose? To comfort and to teach. Till I come, give attendance to reading, read the word of God, and to exhortation and to doctrine. Now this is important to understand today. The Word of God needs to be read. And until the church is getting people into the Word of God, it's, I think, missing its main function. This is very important. Now, this also is applicable to Timothy personally. What is the minister to do today? How is the minister to grow? Well, he's to grow by reading and by exhortation and doctrine. You see, a growing minister makes a growing church, and that's important to see. One of the greatest things ever said concerning Dwight L. Moody was said by a neighbor. They said, every time Mr. Moody comes home, you can just tell how much he's grown spiritually. And what about you? Are you farther along today than you were this time last year? Are you growing in grace and the knowledge of Christ? And the only way to do is by reading the Word of God, the great truths of the Word of God. And now he says to him here, neglect not the gift that's in thee. Now the Spirit of God gives to every believer a gift. And this man had a gift as every believer does. And it was given thee by prophecy. Uh, apparently Paul had predicted and said what this young man would do. And it was with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery, we're told here, I think, what it means, the officers of the church. Now, the laying on of hands never communicates anything, friends. Let's understand that. 
That the idea today, if you put your hand on somebody, that will transfer something. The only thing you can transfer but laying hands on somebody are disease germs. You can transfer those, and that's all. But what does it mean? When you put your hand on a man, it means that now he is a partner with you in the ministry. And I always insisted the officers put their hand on every missionary that we dedicated. Why? that we are partners with them in their ministry. And I think every minister that is ordained should have hands put on him by those that are partners with him, the representatives in the church, the officers, because that is all that it means, but it means a great deal, as you can see. Now he says, meditate upon these things. May I say, that means to be diligent in study. There is no excuse for a minister not to study the Word of God. And there's no excuse for any Christian not to study the Word of God. That is important. Study, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Now, I don't have time to go into it. That's one reason that I refuse to accept devotions for a substitute for reading and studying the Word of God. You can't open the Bible at night when you've got one eye closed already and both feet are already in bed and you turn to a chapter and you're now going to read your chapter. Or in the morning, before you're half awake, you can do that or at the dining table when you're going to make a break for it to get to work. My friend... You couldn't study geometry like that or higher mathematics or any science. And the Word of God is worthy of all that you and I can give it. And I found out I can't give it as much as it ought to have. This is important. Why? Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. And the greatest compliment you can give your preacher is, my, I tell you, you're improving in your preaching. <laughs> That's the best thing you can say. Verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And may I say this very kindly, but I want to say it. God have mercy on the minister who's not giving out the word of God today. Oh, that is, to my judgment, that's a frightful sin. It would be better to be a gangster than to be a man who's supposed to give out the Word of God and he doesn't do it. That's what Paul's talking about here. That's what the church is all about today. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, those are sobering words. If you're in full-time ministry or serving the Lord as you can with your life, Nothing is better training than getting into God's Word every single day. And you can start today if you haven't been doing that. Meditate on His Word and then let it impact you. And to help you in that goal, we got so many different resources for you available over at ttb.org. Now, most of them are free, and the rest are available for a low ministry cost in order to get out God's Word to as many people as possible. You can visit us over at ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE for some more information. Again, we don't rely on the sale of our resources to financially support the ministry. For that, well, we trust the Lord to prompt those who spiritually benefit from our daily studies to give out of gratitude. So thank you for those who generously partner with us and support the Bible bus as we together take God's whole word to the whole world in more than 250 languages. If you want to find out how you can pray with us and provide resources to support this fruitful ministry, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit ttb.org. Again, that's 1-800-65-BIBLE or ttb.org. And remember, you can always write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. Or in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. Now here are a few final thoughts from Dr. McGee. Just before you get off the Bible bus, let me pass this along to you today, and it's from Francis Ridley Havergill. Oh, let me know the power of the resurrection. Oh, let me show thy risen life in calm and clear reflection. 
Oh, let me give out of the gifts thou freely gavest. Oh, let me live with life abundantly because thou livest. And Paul said, Oh, that he might know the power of his resurrection. That was the desire of his heart. May that be the desire of our heart in these days. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.